Hello folks and you are welcome to another live stream. Um, sorry I'm a few minutes late. Again I had a few small teething trouble, uh, teething problems there but nothing major. So you're very welcome and it's great to have you here. I'm here to today to go through loads of theory questions that you could be asked at the start of your driving test. I'm going to give you the questions and answers. I'll just be calling them out. I have a list here to help me. Um, there won't be any graphics on screen or anything like that apart from what you see right now. Uh, I'm also here to answer your questions on driving, on learning, EDT, uh, the driving test. Wojciech first in there. Wojciech, jing dobre. How are you? Good to have you, Wojciech. Um, I'll be answering any of your questions on learning or the test as well, of course. And I'll be going back and to and from the, the questions. Okay, so the questions I'll be going through will be just some of the potential questions that the tester could ask you uh, at the beginning of your driving test. I'll be going through about between 50 and 55 of them and by the time I cover all them you will have probably heard most of the questions that the tester could ask you but there's always a possibility that he or she could ask other ones as well okay. So first of all let's get a few quick announcements out of the way first. Um, I want to share with you one or two experiences that a learner driver sent me and just to go through some of the stuff on screen briefly. So up at the top there in red, daintai at um, gmail.com, that's my email address. If you have any questions on driving, if you're not sure about any aspect of driving, if you want me to look at your report sheet, look at your driving test report sheet, whether you passed or failed, well, more likely if you failed, just email me, daintai at gmail.com. But please, if you're going to email me about your driving test, can you please share some information with me? Don't just email me the driving test report sheet and nothing else. Because that kind of it kind of annoys me to be honest with you. Like I want to help you. I want to make sense of the driving test. But it really it really helps me if you can you know share some information as well and let me know what the tester said to you. Let me know what what you thought went wrong. Describe the situation as best you can. Because the more information I have, the better. Uh, I'm getting nearly getting to the stage. If if people don't give me some feedback, I I'm nearly thinking of not responding to them. But I don't want to get I don't want to get to that stage. So please. Let me, if you, if you want to send me a report sheet, just share some information with me. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, I was talking to uh, a guy called Kevin Horgan during the week. Uh, Kevin is the owner of National Driving School and Ladybird Driving School, two successful franchises. And he has a, a new venture there. I'm not sure how, because I only came across it myself recently. But in yellow there, www.mocktheorytest.ie. So I had a quick look at that during the week, and it seems really, really good. It's a way in which you can do a mock theory test, basically. So you can log in, you can have a free trial, and then there's the paid version as well. And you can uh, do basically mock theory tests where you, you can do it online on his website. And I think it's a great site. It's very, very interactive. And the best thing about it is it, it explains why the answer is wrong if you got a wrong answer. So if you chose the wrong multiple choice answer, at the end then when you're having a little summary and you're giving your score it will tell you why that was the wrong answer or why the correct answer is in fact the correct answer so if you want to check out his site and do some mock theory tests check it out there www.mocktheorytest.ie i'll leave a link in the description as well um in green there myroadsafety.ie that is the place to go if you want to apply for your test or manage your driving test or even apply for your license or learn a permit that's the place to go you could be waiting a while if you're trying to uh, get in touch with the rsa by post or by email or by phone so if you can uh, do most of your dealings on uh, myroadsafety.ie you'll be a lot better off i think um ndls that's the uh, national driver licensing service great website regularly updated very professionally laid out any questions about driving licenses or learner permits or if you want to check your uh, the status of your learner permit you can, there's, there's an expiry calculator on that uh, so some great information there you can apply there as well to book your learner permit to, to book your like interview for your learner permit if you know what I mean where you'll get your photo taken and all that stuff or, or your if you want to book your slot to apply for your full license so ndls.ie for for licensing queries there okay PayPal symbol as well there. Uh, if you want to make a voluntary donation by PayPal, you can do so. I leave a link in the description. Uh, it's completely up to you. you. You can people donate five, ten, fifteen, twenty more, sometimes less. Um, I will 
answer your questions regardless of whether you donate or not. I will go through your driving test report sheet in great detail whether you donate or not. It's completely voluntary, completely up to you, and thank you in advance for any support, okay? So I'm going to be getting on to the questions now very soon, the most common questions that you'll get asked in your driving test, so you can be prepared, so you know what to expect, okay? So I'll be getting to those now <clears throat> very soon. Let's get a few some comments uh, flooding in there. So let's get a few comments done first. Uh, we, we saw Wojciech there. Vic, Vitor Ferreira Souza. There's a great South American Latin name anyway. Hello to you too. Rina Bijan, me, yes, it is you, Rina, thank you, and you're welcome, Melvin, nothing there from Melvin, Rina Bijan again, are you in Mauritius? No, I'm not in Mauritius, I'm about as far away from Mauritius as you can possibly be, I think, I am in a place called Ireland, believe it or not, uh, which is not England, uh, it's up in the North Atlantic, so if you have any questions, Rina, just give me a, give me an email there, my email is on screen, daintai at gmail.com. Actually, I actually got an email from a guy in Mauritius actually during the week that reminds me he was he was wondering was it okay to use my videos on his website, uh, so maybe that's where that comes from. Uh, obviously, I said yes. Uh, if, if anybody that wants to share my videos, listen, I any if my videos are there for anybody who wants them, share away. I I'm not one of these people with a massive ego who has to charge for videos or you know wants permission or anything like that. So if you're a web designer or you're doing a website, just share away. It doesn't bother me. Um, my videos are there for everyone. Sean O'Sullivan, do you know when the Theory Test Centre will open again? Sean, that is a good question, my old flower. The answer is no, I don't know. Uh, it's just not deemed an essential service for now. Um, so it could be, I don't know, it could be summer. But I know, Sean, on that as well, they, there are plans uh, very soon, maybe by the summer, if we're lucky, that the theory test will go online, so you won't have to go into test centers, theory test centers, very soon. So that's the plan. Um, I haven't heard much on that. Like the RSA are not going to tell us. They're not going to tell me anything. I we usually find out find out about these things through the media. So uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I know there's plans to to bring the theory test online. Um, but because it's not an essential service, there's a bit on a bit of uncertainty when it's going to be back up and running again. But hopefully soon. Hopefully by May or June anyway, with a bit of luck. Um. Megan Beelan then, hi Dan, been watching your videos for months past yesterday, brilliant, congratulations Megan Beelan, that's, that's wonderful, and you know you'll always remember that day, I remember the day when I passed my test as well, you'll never forget that feeling, and well done to you Megan. Uh, Mel C then before I get to some questions here, because I'll be able to find that Mel C's comment there with all those lovely uh, sparkler things. Thank you so much for your videos. They helped me pass my test the other day. I'll be donating to your PayPal. Mel C, thank you very much. You're, you're very kind and well done on passing. Great job. I might have guided you in the right direction, but you did the work. You did the test, okay? So anyway, folks, at the start of your driving test, the tester is uh, going to be asking you some theory questions and road signs. Now, you mustn't get too worried or stressed about this. It's not a big part of the test. It is good to get them all right. It is it is good to get most of them right at least. Like it does set you off on the right track and it shows that you've been preparing, it shows that you're confident and it shows that you've done a bit of you you've done your groundwork, let's say. But it's not the be all and end all. If you if you get all the questions wrong or all the signs wrong or some wrong or some signs wrong, it, it doesn't mean you're gonna fail your test, okay? Yes, you're gonna lose a mark, you lose a one grade two mark is the most you'll lose. So don't worry if you get a few wrong, it's no big deal, okay? Now, I have a sheet here just to help me so I don't forget. First question, anyway, when can you overtake on the left, okay? Now, generally, you don't overtake on the left, but you can in certain situations. So, if the car in front is turning right, and if it's a wide road, you could then overtake on the left if you're going straight ahead, or even if you're turning left up ahead. Uh, you could also overtake on the left on dual carriageways and motorways if they're in kind of slower-moving traffic. And you could overtake on the left as well on a one-way street where the traffic in the right lane is moving slower than the traffic in the left lane. You could also potentially overtake on the left in the case of roadworks or if a guard instructs you to or kind of an, you know, an emergency situation um, like that. Okay, so the next one then, what do we have here? What does a broken white line in the center of the road mean? A broken white line. So that just means, you know, keep left of the broken white line, but you can cross it if it's safe to do so, you, you can um, overtake, but only if it's safe to do so, and only if there's no oncoming cars, and as long as you don't put anyone at risk. But if it's a broken broken white line, you can cross 
um, but not a continuous white line, okay? Uh, next question then, what do two sets of broken white lines side by side in the center of the road mean? So that's like, it's a broken white line, but you have twin sets like that kind of dotted up along the road. So again, you, you can cross this if it's safe, but only if it's safe to do so. It means that you're going to have one or more continuous um, white lines up ahead. Okay, so if you see two sets of broken white lines in the road, um, one or two continuous white, one or two continuous white lines ahead, only cross if it's safe to do so. Um, in that situation, okay. So just to just to come back here for a sec, and uh, Melvin has donated there. Thank you very much for your donation, Melvin. I'll get down to you in the comments there now in a, in a moment, but I really appreciate that bit of super chat there. Anyway, folks, let's move on to the next question then, okay? I'm going to get about maybe nine or ten questions done, and then I'm going to kind of jump back to the comments and a few other interesting uh, stuff I heard from my subscribers about their experiences doing the driving test. One very interesting one about uh, a guy who was looking for a refund, actually, for who, who, uh, whose test was cancelled. I'll get to that in about five minutes. just want to get eight or nine questions done first, okay? So, next question then. Um, here, here we are. So, if there are two sets of white lines in the middle, of the road, okay, uh, one broken and one continuous, which one do you obey? So you've got two sets of white lines in the road, one can be continuous and one is kind of like, you know, dotted or broken and they're beside each other, side by side, you have to obey the one that's closest to you, okay, that's the general rule in driving, obey the line closest to you, whether it's on your side or whether it's horizontally in front of you. So if the broken white line is closest to your, your right side, um, you could cross if it's safe to do so, um, but don't cross if the continuous one is closer to you. Okay, so let's see what the next question is here then. Um, what road markings would you see entering a one-way street from the no-entry side? Okay, so if you're if you're entering a one-way street from the no-entry side, you're going to see a continuous line closest to you, continuous solid line, and then the broken white line then. And, and that kind of ties in with the previous question. You'd always obey the line closest to you and you'll probably see the words no entry as well okay let's go on to the next question then um where are we here number number six is it uh yeah number six here on my sheet anyway what does a white triangle painted on the road mean so you you're going to see these everywhere you're going to see them at come up at roundabouts or come up to t-junctions sometimes so a white triangle painted on the road means you have to yield okay now, it doesn't necessarily mean yield to the right only. It means yield to those who have right of way. So yield to anybody on the right or anybody who's on the major road or anybody already turning, okay? It basically means yield or give way. Very often, well, you're going to be driving over the, the point of the triangle, okay? Unless you're going the wrong way, which is not ideal. So you're going to be driving over the point of the triangle. So uh, a white triangle painted on the road just means yield, okay? Now, next question, and number seven, um, if you saw a series of white or yellow uh, horizontal lines with a continuous white or yellow line around them, what does that mean? So these are like lines that are kind of like chevron lines like that. Um, I, I don't even know if that makes sense anyway, but so you're going to, like, they're like chevron lines. You're going to have continuous, they're kind of like um, horizontal lines going across and they're surrounded by um, a solid white line they're basically called hatched lines okay hatched lines you're not allowed to cross them um generally they're, they're white if they're in the middle of the road but they could be yellow if they're on the side of the road you're meant to treat them like an island um so uh don't drive on them don't stop on them unless it's an absolute emergency and you have no choice uh there might be some exceptions maybe for a right turn but generally don't uh cross or drive on those um at, at any time uh, next question then, where are we? What does a broken yellow line on the left mean? So the broken yellow line on the left or a dotted yellow line on the left means that you are looking basically at the edge of the road. So you're not allowed, you're not, you're, well you are allowed to go in there in certain situations but it, it just means the start of the hard shoulder and it's marking out the edge of the road. Now generally the, the hard shoulder is used for cyclists, um, pedestrians, maybe slow vehicles as well if, if it's safe um you, you could stop on the hard shoulder like if you're broken down maybe in an emergency or something like that okay now if it's a solid yellow line on the left you might find that on a motorway for example so you're not allowed 
to cross or stop or park there unless the guard tells you to do so or unless it's an emergency okay so let's see are we on to number 10 there now um yes we're on to number 10 now okay and then i'm gonna share a few little bits with you and get a few comments done so number 10 here on my list what does a white zigzag line mean and the yellow zig we'll do the two of them the white and the yellow so the white zigzag lines you'll see them coming up to pedestrian crossings basically so it means that you're approaching a pedestrian crossing and you're not allowed to park or overtake in the area marked out by the white zigzag lines of course watch out for pedestrians nearby as well and keep an eye on the lights if it's a pelican crossing okay so generally that's the story with the white zigzag lines coming up to a pedestrian crossing now if you might you might see yellow zigzag lines from time to time as well they are very very similar there may be a little more flexibility with them but uh, yellow zigzag lines the same thing no parking uh, no overtaking in the areas marked out it means the yellow zigzag lines are more likely to be outside like a school a fire station maybe a hospital maybe an order of multi place that, that those kind of things you know and and there should be a sign nearby giving more detail on when you are allowed park or not allowed park where the yellow zigzag lines are okay so that's our first 10 questions done there and we'll do another 10 in a minute now I want to share I'm gonna to get to the comments in a second here folks um but I wanted to share something with you where was it here now um I had a question during the week from uh, from a learner driver who was asking about the passenger window she basically said uh, then if the passenger window on my car is stuck down will the test be allowed to go ahead and the answer is probably not because uh, your passenger window has to be working in has to be in good working order basically especially during these COVID times because if the tester feels that um, that there's a problem with the passenger window that it might get stuck up or get stuck down I mean that's not good for health and safety reasons you know especially during this COVID times when ventilation is so important so my advice to you out there folks is if your car is a bit iffy in any way whether it's the passenger window or the wipers are a bit dodgy or you know your brake lights are not working listen, either get it either get it fixed or use your driving instructor's car or use another car that you're legally able to drive and insured on okay because to answer your questions the question is simple if the passenger window is not working properly at the very very least it's going to be a problem potentially okay and at the worst there'll be no test and you may have to reapply and pay again okay uh, it's very important that the tester feels that there's no health and safety issue so passenger windows make sure they're working make sure they're in good working order okay um i got an email from another learner driver there he was in touch with me over the kind of on and off over a few weeks basically a slightly unusual situation but he was doing his test uh, he turned up for his test everything was fine he showed his permit he did the technical checks all that stuff as he went out to drive out the test center then anyway the tester decided he was going to cancel the test now the reason for this is because it was a little bit dark so this is going back in december when the evenings were very dark because as you know like it, it can get dark from as early as four tr half three four o'clock here but the tester felt there was a health and safety issue that it was too dark and he decided to cancel the test anyway and he brought him back and the learning driver was a bit puzzled a bit confused as, as you'd expect but he accepted the decision anyway but the unfortunate thing was the learning driver had already paid for a lesson and the the rental of the car so he sent an email then to me asking me would there be any chance of getting a refund on this from the rsa i said i doubt it but it's worth a try you can you can try it if you want but i wasn't very hopeful to be honest with you but anyway to cut a long story short he got his he got his refund he got the full 130 euro back from the rsa that he paid and i'm delighted to hear that uh so he, he wanted to share that with me and i'm sharing it with you now if you think if your test gets cancelled for what you think is an unusual reason and you're out of pocket then what you need to do is you need to get a receipt from your driving instructor to say that you know you paid for this lesson or you paid for the car rental and then show that receipt to the rsa and although it took this guy about six weeks or whatever two, two months anyway to to get his refund he got it and i'm delighted he got uh, he got some justice so just i wanted to share that with you just in case uh, you you might be in a similar situation in the future okay then um and then another slightly unusual one again i mean this the great thing about doing these live streams and reaching out to you folks is that i i learn myself all the time because 
you know, so certain driving instructors would have the biggest egos you will ever see in your life. They think they know everything. Uh, luckily, I don't fall into that category. I'm always uh, thinking I learn something new, and I learn so much from you guys sharing your experiences with me. But this this is probably, a, well, I won't say it's a new one. I, I, I probably suspected this was happening, but a learner driver didn't know that he had to do his theory test. He didn't know about the hand signals, and he didn't know about the technical check. So basically... Uh, this guy emailed me during the week and he he failed his test now he failed by he failed pretty good now you know he, this guy must have got about 25 marks like he, he was not ready at all yeah he might have thought he was ready but in the real world no no way baby and in the course of the email anyway he was just saying to me that the driving instructor that he had was very relaxed he thought it was great had this had this great name you know best best around all this kind of stuff typical you know big e egos being stroked everywhere and to my surprise, the, the learning driver said the driving instructor never went through the fact that he's going to be asked some theory questions and road signs. He never went through the hand signals. He never went through the technical checks at the start where you're asked about the heaters and the lights and, and the oil and, you know, when you open the bonnet. And I can understand how this completely threw the learner driver off. I mean, he, could, he was more than likely a, a capable driver with, with very good potential and he may well have passed, but he said he was so thrown by the fact that all these surprises start popping up from the theory to the hand signals to the technical questions that he, did, he didn't really know whether he was coming or going and he was making mistakes that he wouldn't normally be making. And I just thought it was an interesting story to, to tell because good drivers, good capable drivers, they are good drivers, but if they're thrown by uncertainty, you know, very often it can end bad. So just if you are getting lessons, make sure you're fully aware of what's going on. You know, you're, you're going to get a phone call from the tester. He's going to ask you, are you an essential worker? He's going to ask you to change your mask. He'll give you a mask, basically. He'll, go, he'll ask you some technical questions about the heaters and stuff. He'll ask you a theory at the start. There'll be a reverse turnabout. He'll start. So what, all I'm saying is, without going into too much detail, make sure you're aware of what to expect in the test. Because if you kind of know what to expect, roughly, you're probably less likely to be flustered and then to make subsequent mistakes. So I hope that little uh, story helps you to prepare for your test. Okay then, um, yeah, they're the main ones there for now, okay? So I'm gonna get back to some questions now, but let's go through a few comments here first, folks, before we uh, get to a few questions, okay? Um, so Rena is there, she is. I'm not sure what you are, Rena, but thanks for tuning in anyway. Um, Dennis Sherry again. Hi, Dan. Can I ask about turning right or left where a curb is? Is it important to keep a little bit out before making the turn? Learner drivers tend to follow the curve. I read. Learner learner drivers tend to follow the curve. I read and can clip it. You see, this is one of those things, Dennis, where experience is 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 the key thing. So if you're taking um a a left, I suppose is is the best way to describe it because the curb is on your left end. I always feel that generally speaking, if, if you're on the flat or going downhill, you need to be kind of not able to see the curb out the front because if you can't see the curb, then it should be safe to turn. If you do try and follow the cur the curb too closely, there is a chance you're gonna you're gonna clip it and you're going to, you know, scrape the tires off it, which which you don't really want. Um I always feel as well that it's just just as you're about to turn the wheel. So let's say you're on a left turn, and you've kind of just you're you're, you're so you're like this, and you just bring your hand up. So so just when you're bringing your left hand up just to make that turn, I often find this it's a good idea just to give a little look into the road just like that, and that can kind of help you get your bearings. You can kind of see roughly where the curb is, and it, you can kind of adjust yourself then. And, and then if if there's a drain as well, you know you want to be keeping out from the drain the drain because sometimes you have a drain that will kind of dip in the road. So you don't want to be hugging the curb too much like that. Okay, um, Brian K. Hello, Dane, the driving teacher, YouTube legend. Well, you know, I've been called worse. Get in lane with the great Dane, as they say. But thanks for being here, Brian. Good to have you. Sean O'Sullivan. I have a book for next month, so it looks like I will be backdated. Is that the theory test, Sean? Um, will you ask me about that? I, I can't remember, but um, but good luck with it anyway. If, if it's the theory test, you could be waiting a while yet. It's like everything, Sean. All our lives are on pause at the moment. With this COVID thing, so uh, the important thing to remember is, you know, it will, we will get through this. Things will get back to some level of normality, and this will all be a distant memory soon enough. So just hang in there, and it'll be fine. Dennis says, "Congrats, Megan, good man, Dennis." Voicek, Voicek, Dobra Munch, isn't it? 
Um, a question many people ask, what is the purpose of the theory questions on the practical driving test? Well, Wojciech is a real, you know, he comes across as a bit of, of a philosopher about uh, driving. You know, he shared lots of informa information with me over the last couple of weeks. So fair play to you, Wojciech. You do sound like a bit of a character. So the purpose of the theory questions on the practical driving test is just to kind of balance out the learning. The, the tester is kind of looking at you and seeing can you answer a question under under say a little bit of pressure it's it's a way of kind of uh, generalizing test generalizing the test as well and it's a way of i suppose finding out if the learner driver has a reasonably good knowledge of uh, the theory basics because it could have been six months 12 months or 18 months since he'd done his theory test before so when you're doing something there's always going to be a bit of theory and practical involved like if you're doing college exams or school exams as well very often there'll be a bit of both so it's just it's just all part of the learning process it's very quick though it's not it's not like the be all and end all if you don't get it right or if you don't get every question right um but it, it is it is part of the the learning um process you know and very often i find that if i have someone if i'm teaching someone how to drive and, and they're getting a lesson off me you know just just before the test all i have to do is just ask them two or three general theory questions and i will have a pretty good idea then if they know them if they've studied because i would sometimes point them in the direction of a list like a list of 50 or whatever questions or 30 or 40 questions and you know as a as an instructor and i'm sure it's the same for testers if if you just pick out three or four questions and they get them right and they answer them quickly and with confidence you have a fairly good idea that they've done their work then and it's like this voice check if if you know your theory you're probably going to be a better driver because you can understand the philosophy of it and you can understand the foundations of it you know uh life is not all about doing things in a practical sense it's nice to have the basics as well and that's why the theory is important and it kind of sets people up uh, sets them on the right track for driving manny cabby hell yeah do right okay no, no, good man manny or good woman whatever whatever that is i'm not really sure kira ivers then hi then hope you're well i've been worse Passed my test, yes, that's brilliant. Yes, that's great. Uh, your videos helped me so much over the last few months in the run to my test. You're a great teacher. Well, thank you very much, Kira, and well done on passing. Um, that's that's a great job, and you'll remember that day for a long time. So, delighted to hear that. Thanks for your kind uh, words. Kira, again, then, thanks for everything. I've sent a, a very well-deserved uh, donation through PayPal. Have a great... Thank you very much, Kira. I appreciate that. Um, I... I will always email back people if they if they've donated by by paypal so kira delighted on your good news and thank you very much for your support uh, much appreciated then sherry then theory questions are there to help you prepare for your 12 edt lessons and beyond by the time you start driving you have a solid grounding in what to expect as you are putting the theory into practice that is the comment of the day dennis thank you for for that i think you've just summarized uh, a great answer there to Wojciech's question and very well said there Dennis so I'm going to read it out again now folks just just and that'll be the last comment before I go back to my next uh, 10 questions here theory questions are there to help you this goes for the signs as well to help you prepare for your 12 EDT lessons as well as your your future uh, life of driving and beyond by the time you start driving you have a solid grounding in what to expect as you are putting theory into practice so very well said there dennis and on that note let's go back to some theory questions here then okay where's my water okay so let's do 11 to 19 or something here now at a stop sign with no white line where should you stop well at the sign folks at the sign so just try be have your front lights kind of level with the sign if there is no white line now now usually there should be a white line especially if you're in town or if the place is well maintained but if it's not, just stop level with the sign and then just creep out gradually and gently if you need to see better. Now, you might not need to creep out, but it is a good idea to creep out sometimes if it's a blind junction. OK, next question. What's the difference between a single and double continuous yellow line? So this is about no parking. You might have a, on the left, you might have a, a continuous single, like one single continuous yellow line, uh, usually in towns. Now, this is not to do with the hard shoulder on the motorway or, or main road or anything. Uh, so a single one means no parking at certain times, maybe nine to five. There could be a sign nearby to help with more information on that. And then a double yellow line means uh, no parking at any time. Okay, so that's to do with parking. When can you cross 
um, a continuous white line. So generally you're not allowed to cross a continuous white line, but, but you could cross it in certain situations like so in very, very slow moving, if you're dealing with a very slow moving hazard in front of you, like, like a cyclist or, or, or a tractor or something like that, and you can see clearly ahead of you and there's no danger, you could then cross the continuous white line only because it's an emergency and only because you're driving in a practical way. The other option there is to stay behind the tractor or, or the slow moving vehicle for the next, I don't know, two or three kilometers, but that's, that's, that's not really practical, like, you know. Um, you can also cross the continuous white line if you're crossing a broken white line, as I alluded to earlier on, or in an, in an emergency, like if a guard asks you to, or, or if you're a flagman or something like that, or for access or, um, you know, access into a, into a premises or, or something like that. Next one then, what is a yellow box junction or a junction box and what is the general rule? So uh, a yellow box junction is um, an area where you can roll into the middle on a green light, let's say, um, provided it's safe. And then you would wait in the middle and give way to oncoming cars who have right of way. But don't, um, don't stay stranded in the middle though after the light subsequently goes red. So that's what a junction box would be. Let's just say, let me just say, well, why did I word this? What number is this? Number 14 here. So yeah, keep, so keep the yellow box clear. So generally don't stop in the yellow box on this. Don't stop in the yellow box uh, generally, but there is an exception, like if you're turning right, okay? So keep the yellow box clear. Don't enter unless you can clear it. An exception is if you're turning right, as long as you don't obstruct other traffic. Yeah, okay, that's the best way of saying that. Um, next question, number 15, folks. Um, what's a clear way? So just think of the word clear. A clear way is an area of road where you're not allowed to stop or park during the time shown. Okay, you might find it um, in town, so very often it'll be an urban clear way. So no parking, no stopping during the times shown. Okay, the exception would be maybe buses and taxis and certain other vehicles like that. Um, at an uncontrolled junction with roads of equal importance, uh, to whom should you give way? So generally here it will be traffic on the right and traffic already turning, okay? So that's if it's an uncontrolled junction and there's no road markings and you're not sure who has right of way. Just treat it like a roundabout. Give way to traffic on the right or traffic already turning, okay? Um, next one then, where are we? Number 17 here. What position would you take turning right from uh, a one-way street? So if you're on a one-way street, the best position then if you want to take a right turn is to move into the most extreme right-hand lane while at the same time watching out for any signs or markings that might dictate where you need to go. Because if it's a two or a three lane area, you may be in the middle lane for a right turn. It does depend. But generally speaking, if you're on a one-way street and you want to take a right turn, usually the most right-hand lane would be the most practical one, okay? But watch out for markings and signs in the area. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, what position, sorry, yes, number 18. How would you take a right, a right turn? Um, how would you take a right turn from from a main road into a minor road? So you would generally, uh, in this situation, follow the pro MSMM so mirrors uh, signal. Check your mirrors again. You might need to give a little quick glance over the shoulder just if you're changing lanes or going into a filter lane. Now that might not always be necessary, but check your mirrors. Indicate double check the mirrors move over to, to a right of center position in your lane kind of gradually uh you know get down the gears keep the gear changes nice and smooth you go down one by one or maybe you might be better off just skipping from four to second or whatever um give way to traffic that has right of way uh proceed then with a, with a bit of juice because you know if, if you're on a main road you want to get off it fairly lightly you don't want to be dragging across the road uh never cut the corner okay unless again unless it's an emergency or something like that don't cut the corner and then make good progress on the next road as well, okay? Let me just see, give you the wording advice that I, I'll read out with the answer there. So how would you turn, what, what number was it, 18 or something, was it? 18, how would you turn right from the main road? Mirrors, signal, position your car just left of the center white line, so that's, you know, moving moving over to the right. Get down the gear smoothly, take the turn when a safe gap occurs, never cut the corner, and yield to people and cyclists. Yes, I forgot to say that, watch out for people and cyclists as well that could be nearby. Remember, folks, pedestrians, they're not the brightest sparks on the old bonfire. They can do unpredictable things, so keep your eyes peeled. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Number 18, that was. So number 19, then. Um, when would you use your fog lights? Um, a lot of people think that you use fog lights in the fog, 
but uh, it's not really true folks not really um you'd use your fog lights if the fog is dense and you can't see 100 meters um you can't see more than 100 meters you would also use the fog lights in falling snow and possibly torrential rain if there's a lot of steam or something around the place remember fog lights are are the, like the front fog lights are fairly limited they, they'll just they're just they're very low down so because fog rises the front fog lights are kind of they're shining on the ground so they give you a little bit of visibility on the ground but they don't really do a whole lot the most important thing when when you have fog whether it's dense or any kind of fog is don't use the full headlights because the full headlights will just highlight the fog and it may actually impede your visibility okay so generally use fog lights if the fog is dense or in falling snow and number 20 here then so we're just nearly halfway through the, the common questions here number 20 when would you uh, when would you use your hazard warning lights so generally in an emergency if you're involved in an accident if you're at the scene of an accident um if your car is getting towed or you could you could use your hazard warning lights if you're going to slow down kind of sharply up ahead and you want to warn the driver behind you that there's a sudden slowdown coming up um but yeah any time where it's uh where you're, where you're causing an obstruction or you are you're maybe in the middle of an obstruction it's good to use the hazard lights just tells the people behind you that you're you know that something is going on up ahead okay so that is number 20 then and we'll be coming back to that the rest of those questions very 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 soon as i said folks my email is there danetai at gmail.com any questions any driving test report sheets you want me to have a look at just email me there remember Give me some information about the driving test. Don't just send me a report sheet and ask you what went wrong. I like information. Information is power. Uh, the more information you tell me about what happened in your driving test, what went wrong, what the tester said to you, well, the better the feedback will be, okay? MockTheoryTest.ie, great website. If you want to do some mock theory tests as you're, as you're preparing for your theory test, you can do so there. You can do, avail of a free trial. Um, and the great thing about that is uh, the site will explain to you why the right answer is the right answer and why you got it wrong okay myroadsafety.ie apply for your test apply for your licenses uh, looking for a cancellation check out myroadsafety.ie ndls for your national driver licensing service great website all about the driving licenses there or if you want to apply for a learner permit check that out if you want let's get back to some um, comments here and we're going to then return to some common questions Amy, if my engine light comes on on the morning of my test, will they be very strict on that? And will my test go ahead? Well, that's a good question, Amy. Um, well, let me find Amy's commenter again now. Um, here we go. Uh, will they be very strict on that? Well, do you know something, Amy? I was literally just talking to a tester about that a few weeks ago. A tester that, that I'd be kind of confirming various bits and pieces with. And the answer is it depends on the light. Like, if, if it's an airbag light, or uh, a light saying that your oil is is a bit low uh that's serious like i mean that that's kind of like uh you know that, that's a health and safety thing like but we know i don't think there'll be any tests going ahead then but if it's just um if it's just a service light i mean that's no big deal it, nobody's going to care about that like that a service light is just the the where the um the, the warning light might come on just just to tell you that the car is due a service maybe uh, so that that'll be fine. It all depends on the light you see. It all depends on the on what how serious it is. Like you know, you might have an emissions light as well. That shouldn't be a big deal, but it it does depend on the tester. It's a bit of a grey area, Amy, and it depends on the tester and it depends on the light. But in simple language, uh, you're always better off getting these things sorted out and not having that doubt hanging over your mind. Okay. P A, thanks for your help. Passed my test first class. Great stuff. P A, well done on passing. Uh, great job. You did great. Uh, delighted to hear that. Fike Usman, yes sir, okay. Kevin Horgan there as well, good to see you Kevin, I'll, I'll be uh, talking to you soon. Um, thanks for tuning in. Ra, uh, Ra, R. Bosca, hi Dan, thanks for the reply by email yesterday. Yeah, my pleasure, I really did appreciate what you did. I can't believe how detailed was your reply. I just made my donation by 20. Well, it's my pleasure, um, R. Bosca, I think I, I remember the email, yeah. Like I, I'd always try and be as specific as I can, um, in the emails, um, because you know, as I said, information is power. But I always, prefer, I always like when people do the same for me. Like, so if you're going to send me your driving test report sheet, the more information you give me, the better. Uh, or if you don't, or if, even if the tester said nothing to you, at least tell me that. Like, don't, don't leave me wandering there, or scratching my head, wandering. Like, and I, and you were pretty good from what I remember about telling me what happened there. 
So I appreciate your donation as well, uh, Orboska. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, Smart Gamer eighty one. Yeah, hello to you too. I think you're holding up some money there. Yeah, if you want to share some with me, I won't say no anyway. Sasha uh, Guha McMahon. Hi, Dan. Have a test on Tuesday and did a pre-test, but I feel it was marked easy. So that's an interesting comment there by Sasha Guha McMahon. As a driving instructor myself, folks, everybody's different and, and everybody does things their own way. But I have to be honest with you, I don't really do any of these pre-test stuff. Um, I think they can give a false sense of security uh, to people. I know some people find them useful and, and they have their uses. Like, But I prefer to deal in with lessons and treat everything as a lesson. Like, So I would do a lesson and I would do certain things and I would ask the learner driver what happened there. How do you think you could improve on that? Rather than just sitting there uh, for half an hour, writing a few bits down and telling the person where to go. Because sometimes in, in, in a pretest, if you're doing it with your instructor, it's it, it just seems easier because the atmosphere is more relaxed. It's a lot different when you have the real test, you know. So I try and uh, avoid pretests as much as I can and just constantly deal with uh, specific mistakes, specific weaknesses. And I'm always asking the learner driver what did they think or how did they feel that went or how could you do that better. And then we might do it again and again. So like, for example, on a pretest, if you mess up a reverse around the corner, you pretty much get one shot at it and then we go. But in a driving lesson that I would do, if you mess up the reverse around the corner, well, then I'd, I'd probably get you to do it two or three or four more times until you get it right. And then you leave the reverse feeling better because you've achieved an improvement. You know, that's that's my logic anyway. It's not not every driving instructor is going to do that. Uh, but just to just to summarize your point, Sasha, I can under, I can completely understand what you mean. A, a, a pretest can feel a lot different because you, you know your instructor, you know, he or she is probably going to be a little bit maybe lenient on you. And anyway, everybody's perception is different. The driving test is going to be completely different. The atmosphere, the feel of it is going to be very, very different. So just anything, anytime you do a pretest and you and you get a, a pass or you think it went well, just take it with a very, very large pinch of salt because it is very much just a mock test and it's very often just not comparison with the real thing, okay? Okay, so we'll come back there to those comments in a second. Let's get a few more questions done then, folks. Okay, we were on 20, I think. So number 21 then. When would you dip your headlights, okay? So let's say you have your full headlights on. You would you would dip them, like if you had your full headlights on, you would dip them if you're meeting oncoming traffic or if you're following oncoming traffic or if you're in fog or um, it, basically to avoid inconveniencing other um, road users, okay? If you're meeting pedestrians, meeting cyclists, that kind of stuff. Maybe coming to a junction as well, okay? Let me just give you the answer to make sure I'm not missing anything there. So, number 21. Um, so, when meeting or following traffic in a well lit sorry, in a well-lit area, I forgot about that, sorry, in a well-lit area, in snow, heavy rain, fog, and at dawn and dusk as well. Yeah, okay. Um, I was probably answering a slightly different question. You, you would use your dipped headlights then. Um, you would use them in those areas that, that I mentioned there as well. So where there's fading light, like dawn and dusk, um, bad weather, like, you know, fog, you would use your dipped, use your dipped headlights in fog, rain, mist, and you would use them at night as well, of course. And, um, you know, it's always good to use your dipped headlights um, 24 hours, like all day anyway, because it just makes you more visible um, to other road users. Next question then, um, if you're dazzled by the lights of an oncoming car, what would you do? Well, if you're dazzled by the lights, don't look directly at the lights. Look towards the left verge a little bit and use your peripheral vision to guide you. And if you need to, just slow down and stop. Okay. Uh, next one then. When, why would you use your horn and what restrictions are there in relation to the use of the horn? So generally, you would not use your horn in a built-up area between 11.30 um, at night and 7 in the morning, unless it's some kind of an emergency. Generally, the horn is just there as, as an emergency to, to warn other people of your presence. For example, if they haven't seen you uh, in an emergency situation like that. So let me just what, let me just give you the official answer there. Uh, number 23. Um, it's used to warn other road users of danger and to make them aware of your presence when needed for safety reasons, as I said. It's not to be used between 11.30 and 7 a.m. in a built-up areas unless an emergency. Okay. So let's see our next common theory question then that the tester might ask you. Um, let's have a look. 
uh, how would you know a zebra crossing at night? Now you generally know a zebra crossing at night from the flashing amber beacons on the on the crossing on the kind of the the poles, let's say. But you might also know know it by the sign that comes before it, because very often the sign is going to be reflected if it's there. Or you may have kind of reflective studs, kind of like cat's eyes on the road. But uh, hopefully by the flashing amber beacons would be the main way you would know those as well. Um, what does an island in the centre of a pedestrian crossing mean? So this means that both crossings are separate, so it kind of divides it into two. So if you have an island in the middle, it just kind of divides the crossing in two and each one is separate, okay? And the pedestrian might wait on the island um, if needs be to wait for a safe opportunity to cross. Um, what does a flashing amber light mean? So a flashing amber light means you can go, but but only if it only if there's no pedestrians. If, if it's a flashing um, circular light, I mean. So you can proceed, but only if there's no pedestrians. Give way to pedestrians. Um, what does an amber light mean? Just just a straight amber light at traffic lights. Stop unless you're too close to stop safely okay so if you come into a set of traffic lights and it's green just watch out because you know green is it could it could change to amber very easily uh, so be prepared to stop but at the same time don't be too slow and if it does go amber you should stop but that's only if you could stop safely don't stop where, where it means slamming on the brakes and doing it in a dangerous way okay um next question what does a green arrow light mean or a filter light so that means you can go in the direction of the light. So if you have a green arrow light pointing um, left, you can go left even if the red light is on, okay? So you can go in that direction. Um, what does a flashing amber arrow light mean? So a flashing amber arrow light means you can go in that direction, but only if it's safe and only if there's no cars or no, no vehicles coming on the adjoining road. So just be careful with the difference between a flashing amber and the... Uh, uh, green filter light okay the, the, you have to be a lot more careful at the well you have to be careful at the mall but you should be, be extra careful at the flashing amber arrow light because that just means pretty much the same as a yield sign so just watch out for other cars that are on the adjoining road or maybe on the right okay so um next one then number 30 is it uh number 30 what's the sequence of traffic lights let's go down for a second so the sequence of traffic lights i always think of the word of the name gary g-a-r-y okay so a g for green um a for amber um and r for red okay so the the lights will go f you might have the lights be green then it will go from um go to amber sorry and then red and then it might it might then subsequently go back to green or it might go to flashing amber okay so that will be the sequence of lights green amber and then red okay and it possibly might go to flashing amber after red it does depend on the if it's a pelican crossing or if it's just a standard set of traffic lights okay Okay, folks, I'll be getting, I'm, I'm coming back to more questions now very, very soon. Let's get a few more comments in there now. Where was I? Where did I stop? Um, I saw Sasha, wasn't it? About the mock test, yeah. I think that was it. Okay, Prince, Prince Fola, please, if you are dazzled by oncoming vehicle, what do you do? Secondly, if you're dazzled by a vehicle from behind, what do you do? Well, I've answered the first one, but I'll answer it again for you, Prince Fola. What a great name um if you're dazzled by an on by the lights of an oncoming car um don't look directly at the lights look towards the left verge of the road and if you need to slow down and stop well then do do so okay maybe use your peripheral vision if you're looking to the left verge um the, the main thing is don't look directly at the lights the second question if you're dazzled by a vehicle from behind you well that, that's a good question yeah so if you're dazzled by the vehicle from behind you you can you can adjust your um your center mirror there's a little flick at the bottom of it and you kind of just twist that little little kind of adjustment and then what happens is the the light is reflected away from you and you are seeing a reflection of what's behind you rather than the mirror version of, of what's behind you okay so adjust your center mirror to night vision mode and uh, that will stop the uncomfortable dazzle of the car behind you okay of course you could also pull in in a safe place as well and let, let the other car overtake you if, if that's practical and if that is safe to do so uh, sometimes a car might dazzle you from behind and they might not realize that their full headlights are on or they could have their dipped headlights on but they could be kind of misaligned a little bit maybe um so that it, it might not be intentional um it could be just it could be a bit of carelessness by the other car or it could be it could be that they just they just don't know uh but good questions though thanks for that prince kishwar nahid thanks you're very welcome kishwar best wishes to you rami bustami 
uh, good to see you again, Rami. I, I remember that name. Uh, hi, great, hi to the great, great, great Dane. You know, get in lane with the great Dane as the saying goes. Thank you, Rami. Um, next comment, where are we? Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Here we go. Amy again. Sorry, Dane. Uh, what did you say about the engine light I missed? Oh, yeah, I, Amy was asking about the engine light. So you mentioned about the, if, if a warning light comes on on your, on your car, uh, for, say, for a test, and I was only talking to a tester about this uh, very very recently. The war like it's never a good it's never good to have a warning light on the dashboard, okay? But it does depend on what light is on. So if it's um if it's just a service light, for example, that the car is just are reminding you to get your car serviced, that's no big deal. I mean that should be absolutely no problem. It's it's just it's just a bit of information that the car's uh, technology is sharing with you. But if the engine light is about an oil shortage or if the engine light is about there's an airbag malfunction or something like that the airbag isn't working well then i don't think there'll be any test then so it does depend on what light is on you know it might be an emissions light that should be okay as well but it depends on the light and to a certain extent it can depend on the tester as well because there's no like like there's no guidebook there's no there's no rules rule book that they have ever told us like with like it's a very good question amy but the honest answer is like the RSA who run the driving test, they, they don't tell us anything. Like I am I would have to go and seek out testers to get this information because they, they tell you nothing. They won't answer the phones, they won't respond to emails. Getting information out of the RSA is like trying to get blood out of a turnip. It's 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 next to impossible. So the best I can do there is answer that for you in that way that what the tester said to me there recently. Um it depends on the light, um uh, but you know, you should always make sure that there's no, um, you know, diagnostic lights on your car, and then you'll have that peace of mind then that uh, everything will be okay. Okay, so best wishes to you, Amy, and just email me daintai at gmail dot com if you want any more questions answered. Okay, let's get a few more comments done then, folks, and uh, we'll be finishing up maybe in fifteen minutes or so, and then I'm going to get the rest of the questions done as well. So Sarah ninety three, hi Dan, hope you're well. If a person wanted to become a driving instructor, how does one go about applying, starting uh, that process? Watching the rugby later, I sure I'm watching the rugby. Although the the Italian match is not 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 generally the top match I I always look forward to. Um, Sarah, that reminds me of a great podcast that Kevin Horgan had up um on the Anchor app actually. So if you if you were to download on the play store or wherever you download your stuff download anchor app a n c h o r and just type in then uh, how to become a driving instructor ireland kevin horgan who's who owns ladybird driving school goes through that in in lots of detail if you want to email me i, I can email you the link actually um but if you want to become a driving instructor there, there's three stages there, there you have to do the theory test first and then you have to do the, the practical driving test, which is a longer driving test and it involves a lot more than your standard driving test. And then there's a stage three then, which is a instructional ability test, like a communications test. And that's basically how, how it is. But if you were to if you were to Google that, you, I'm sure you'll find plenty of information, even on the RSA website as well, rsa.ie. Uh, I'm sure you'll find lots there. But uh, I think that podcast would be good. So, so download the Anchor app and search how to become a driving instructor Ireland. Uh, by Kevin Horgan, and you'll you'll get a good step by step guide for that. Um, void check then. Uh, so a learner told that their instructor hadn't taught them about some test topics. Unfortunately, I've already heard about some instructors who do that on purpose and teach correctly only after failed uh, the test to make more money. Yeah, there would. I mean, the just I I'd like to think. People are good people, Wojciech, but there are going, there are unscrupulous people out there, and uh, unfortunately, you'll, you'll get that in all in all walks of life, yeah. So definitely on on definitely not not desirable. But thanks for sharing that, anyway. Dennis Sherry, that's shocking, Wojciech. The instructors are deliberately not preparing their pupils for the test just to get more money out of them for extra tuition after hope someone reports them. I don't know how widespread it is now, folks. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure most driving instructors are are good people and to do things the right way so um i'd say they would be the exceptions rather than rather than the rule but anyway the customer is always king they can you know easily if they want to report um uh, misbehavior like that or they can change instructors anyway ar good afternoon good afternoon to you any rules for independent driving yeah lots of rules ar it's called the rules of the road 
Um, I do some independent driving with people uh, if, if I have time or if, if they're at the required standard where I would just um, ask them to go to a certain destination and I would allow them just to just to make their own way to that destination and you know take their own route um, but yeah that's like I, I'm not really sure what you mean by any rules for independent driving I, I'm not like um, I, I don't know what you're asking there but if, if you want to be more specific with me and ask me a better question I, I'll, I'll be happy to answer it um, let's see another comment there then and I'm going to get some questions done here folks um, Joe's, Joe's Imon ND hi then you are really a godsend pardon person I suppose for me because your videos help me a lot pass uh, through the driving test okay I'm not a big fan of all that text speak but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt just in case English is not your first language uh, Joe's Imon you're very welcome uh, I'm I'm only too happy to help and I'm glad you found find it helpful. My email is there as well if you have any questions or if you have any queries about driving. Um, but it looks like you've passed your test. If I can just decipher your um, language here, it looks like you've passed your test. So obviously you're a very good driver and that's brilliant news and congratulations uh, to you. And thanks for commenting. So we'll come back to the next few comments there now, folks. I mean, let's get some questions done here first anyway. So we're over halfway through the questions here. Um... And I'm going to try and get the majority of the most common questions done here now, and a few little extra technical ones as well. Okay, so let's let's get on with it here then. Um, number thirty one here at traffic lights where the lights are not working, who has right of way? So this is like the crossroads that's unmarked. Traffic on the right or traffic already turning would have right of way in that situation if if the lights are malfunctioning. Um, what do two flashing red lights mean at a level, level crossing? Well, it means stop because there's a train coming, okay? So if you see two flashing red lights side by side, watch out, there's a train coming. So stop at the line. I'm sure, I'm sure that you'll be well signposted for that anyway. What is the legal parking distance from the curb? Half a meter is ideal there, folks. Half a meter. It could be maybe 48 in, 12 inches, 13 inches, or 48 centimeters. But half a meter would be ideal. How close to a junction and a pedestrian crossing can you park? Well, five meters from a junction and 15 meters from a pedestrian crossing would be the general rule there. Um, where should you not park then is the next question, number 35. Well, there's lots of places you should not park, like some of them we've already mentioned, like on, on a single continuous yellow line, on a double yellow line, um, in a clear way, on hatch lines, opposite a continuous white line, um, you should, on, on a bend, um, let me I'll just go to my list here so I'm not forgetting that in here folks so where's you know number 35 um, so let's see you don't park on a corner bend brow of a hill or humpback bridge where there's a sharp dip in the road anywhere that blocks the view of a school warden don't park in a disabled space unless you have a permit um, on white or yellow zigzag lines as I mentioned earlier on in the video um, any yellow box, uh, clear ways I mentioned yeah, um, pedestrian, on a pedestrian crossing, less than 15 meters, in a bus stop, yeah, I forgot about that bus stop, um, bus lane, taxi rank, where there's a single or double continuous white line in the center of the road, on a footpath, grass margin, cycle lane, within five meters of a junction, unless parking spaces are clearly marked, that's okay then, loading bay or in a tram lanes or on train tracks okay there's loads there folks there's loads there yeah i couldn't remember them all in the one go but that's where areas where you shouldn't park anyway okay and then where should you not overtake and again some of them will be similar like so you shouldn't overtake on on a bend on the brow of the hill um continuous white lines anywhere where your view ahead is obstructed like in bad weather or fog or something like that so let me just listen corner bend brow of a hill don't overtake humpback bridge continuous white line hatched lines pedestrian crossings anywhere where your view is restricted okay next question then uh let's see um what is the two second rule so the two second rule is a rule you should implement in terms of following traffic so you should stay two seconds behind the vehicle in front so when the vehicle in front passes a fixed object like a sign or something like that then you should not pass that same sign until at least two seconds later Double it in the wet and leave 10 or 11 seconds if it's in snow or icy weather, okay? 
um, what are the various speed limits? So it depends where you are. Like generally in town, it could be 50 or maybe 60 kilometers. Out on country roads, like, like regional rural roads, it could be 80 kilometers, or you might have the rural speed limit sign, which means that the speed limit might be 80 or maybe 60, depending on what the sign is. But the rural speed limit sign, which is white with the kind of black stripes going through it, means drive at a speed that is safe and considerate and don't treat the speed limit as a target. Then, excuse me, on a national road, you might have 100 kilometers and then on a motorway, 120. Um, okay, next question then. Um, so who's not allowed on a motorway? So there's quite a few categories of people not allowed on a motorway. So learner drivers for a start, um, invalid carriages, um, animals, uh, cyclists, um, like, who else is there? What is it? I'm a 39 there. I just go to the quite answer here just to give you the official one. But there's quite a, quite a few categories of people there. Um, L drivers, vehicle without inflated tires, that's like invalid carriages or, or, you know, people who drive those kind of like scooters. Vehicles under 50cc, uh, 50cc or under. Um, slow vehicles, yeah, I forgot about that. So they have to be able to do at least 50 kilometers. Invalid cars, like I mentioned, cyclists, animals, and pedestrians, I already mentioned, yeah. Okay, so there'd be people not allowed on a motorway. Um, are you allowed to stop on a motorway? Well, the answer is no, you're not allowed to stop on a motorway, but there's always going to be exceptions, like so if like if it's an emergency or if a guard instructs you to do so, you, you, you'll have to stop then. But, but generally, no, no stopping on a motorway. Um... So who may use a bus lane? Well, buses, obviously, uh, taxis and cyclists can use a bus lane generally if the signs allow. Um, but if it's a contraflow bus lane, it's usually only um, buses are allowed to do that, okay? Um, next one then, what is, what is a long vehicle, okay? So a long vehicle is a vehicle at least 13 meters long, so it could be like a truck or something like that. And if you're overtaking such a vehicle, you're going to need, obviously, extra road space to uh, overtake them. Okay. Next question then, folks. Let me see. If you saw a red reflective triangle on the road, what does that mean? So that means that, that somebody is warning you of a hazard or a problem up ahead. It could, be a, it could be an incident up ahead or a crash up ahead or something like that. So it's just a warning, okay? Um, what is it? What's next here? Now, how would you check your tires? Well... You check your tires by looking first of all at the wall of the tire that, that's the part that's looking out make sure there's no bulges no scratches um you can check the depth then as well so the minimum tire tread depth is 1.6 millimeters so you can rub your finger along the the tread on that on the central three quarters uh, make sure the nuts are nice and tight make sure the valve caps are on as well and check the tire pressure as well you can do that in a, in a garage maybe or, or bring it to some kind of garage to do it officially Make sure that the proper pressure is in the tires and uh, yeah that's basically how you would check your tires um let's see what else have we got here how have we done that name four people in authority who you must stop if they request you to if they request you to do so okay so you stop for a guard obviously if he he or she asks you to do so um a school warden uh someone you know with the, the lollipop lady or the lollipop man let's say um anybody in charge of animals um a flag man or flag woman as well in charge of a situation um who else is that is that four let me just check the answer four people in thirty minutes number 45 um a guard a school warden flag man or, yeah or a person in charge of animals yeah next question then folks let's see um what is a two plus one road so a two plus one road is a road that has two lanes going one direction, say usually there'd be two non-motorway lanes, kind of like a like a national road type of thing, and then one lane going the opposite way. So it kind of helps traffic flow as well because it kind of creates an overtaking lane. So it's it it's it's a, they're good roads to have around you. You'd often see them on on national roads depending on where you are. Um. So what is meant by the term aquaplaning? So this is when you lose control of your vehicle, for example, in wet weather and it could be could be due to poor tire maintenance or something like that so let's just give you the official one here um so i'm not leaving anything out so when but when bald or worn tires on the road on the car can no longer cope with the buildup of water underneath them it can lead to loss of control and that's kind of related to why you should always make sure your tires are in good shape because your tires are the only part of the car that's you know touching the ground 
Okay, just getting towards the home straight on the questions here, folks. Uh, how do you reverse safely? Okay, so first thing went to reverse safely is uh, look all around. Make sure you're constantly checking all around. Don't just look in the mirrors. Make sure your reversing light is on and, and test your reversing light as well so you can go back, reverse your car back against some glass or something like that or ask someone to check it. So if your reversing light is on, it means that more people are going to be aware of what you're doing because the reversing light is kind of a bright white light. Keep it slow. Use gentle clutch control. Um, and the slower you go, the more time you have to think and the more time you have to see and take account of everything. But the most important thing about reversing safely is that you look all around and don't just look in your side mirrors or your middle mirror, okay? Um, what did I say for that? Let's just give you the official answer there now that I have written on this. So how to reverse safely, check all around before moving back. Make sure to look in all mirrors and over both shoulders. Give way to pedestrians and other traffic. Reverse slowly and ask for help if required. Look behind most of the time as well as checking the mirrors. Get out and check if you're unsure. Uh, never reverse from minor road onto a major road. That's very important, folks. Never reverse from a minor road onto a major road, okay? Next question then, before we get to a few comments and finish up. Um, what is... What was that question? Uh, coasting, I think, is it? What is coasting? So coasting is driving in neutral or it is driving with the clutch pressed in fully. It can lead to a loss of control because the engine's ability to do natural engine braking is negated. So coasting should be kept to a minimum. For example, when you're stopping or changing gear is fine, uh, but you shouldn't be coasting downhill with the clutch pressed in fully or in neutral because you don't have as much control. The car can go faster and you could end up losing control or maybe braking too harshly. Okay, um, Okay, I still have a few more technical questions to go, folks. Um, just a few, but I want to get to some comments first here. Let's see. Um, okay, Josman, I think I said that then. Yeah, we got his comment. Lionel Nundlovu. Dennis, I agree with you. Instructors are thieves. Yeah, well, it depends which one you're talking about. Um, Noah Thomas again. Hi, Dan. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I get that Noah's comment back there. Hi, any idea when lessons are coming back? Um, I don't. I don't know. To be honest with you, uh, it could be April, possibly, but I'm not really sure because it depends on how the virus is under control. But possibly April, possibly. Um, I, I honestly I don't know. We I, we just have to keep an eye on the news, keep an eye on the on the you know on, on how the restrictions are going and how the virus is going. But let's hope to be back in April. Dennis is talking about his instructor in Sligo. Uh, I'd say it's a tiny, but absolutely. Dennis is a tiny percentage. Most of them are absolutely fine and, and very professional. I'm I'm sure. Um, honest and good people. That's that's very true, Dennis. Uh, Peter Connolly. Hi Dan, I got two grade twos for anticipation in my test. What kind of mistakes would be an example of a grade two anticipation? You see, it's it's all about the definition of anticipation there, Peter. Like the tester is probably saying that you're not looking ahead more. So let's say for example you see a person walking ahead of you and they do this. You know, they they kind of just glance over their shoulder. It means that they they might be thinking about crossing the road or they might be thinking about going towards the pedestrian crossing so you need to anticipate this and stop and let him cross if it's practical if it's safe to do so if you're able to <clears throat> maybe you might you might notice that um a car is just parked on the left for example so you could possibly anticipate then that that car might be straightening up maybe might be, might be kind of doing a bit of maneuvering as he's trying to park or maybe that the door might open up open and and you know you might have to come out a bit to give him a door end uh, a dog on a leash maybe who sees another dog across the road might get a bit excited might might kind of pull the might kind of go towards the other other dog across the road as you're driving down so you anticipating things like that is going to look well on you so it's, it's all about planning ahead there peter you know it's, it's about not looking in your mirrors too much your mirrors are grand your mirrors are great you know if you're if you're changing direction or if, or if you're changing lanes or something like that mirrors are very important but if you're driving along a road, it's 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 so important to be thinking what's ahead of you. You know, like what's what what's that what's that car doing up there? Like that car has his brake lights on. That means he might be slowing down. So I have to slow down now. You know, it's it's all about looking ahead more so than what's behind you. A donation there. Thank you very much. Who gave me a few bob there? Um, 
I, someone get Ar Ar Armands is it Armands I think yeah thank you very much Armands for that I'll, I'm sure I'll get down to your comment there in a second or I'll get down to it but really appreciate that 12 euros <coughs> sorry 12 dollars actually uh, thank you much appreciated Shiloh Shiloh or Shiloh Shiloh my test was cancelled because of my ABS light was on I'm not surprised there Shiloh it was a good question by um, that person earlier on <coughs> Amy was it or something I, I, I might be forgetting the name sorry um, so if your ABS light is on, that means that there's a problem with your ABS braking system. And if I was a tester and I was doing a test with somebody, I can guarantee you one thing: I wouldn't do a test if uh, I felt there was a problem with the ABS lights. So or with the ABS uh, brakes. Um, King, King Yooks, or King Yo, or whatever it is. Hi, bro. My provisional form is signed in all black, but their person who certified the form and photos. In blue will they accept it I think so King you or however I'm saying that now I don't think it matters what I don't think it matters what um, what color ink it's signed in unless it says on it I mean, maybe it says on it does it um, I don't I'm not really sure but I, I don't think that will be a big problem but if it is um, <clears throat> will you let me know and come back to me and email me let, let me know because I'd, I'd be interested to find out if it is a problem but my instinct is it's not a problem but you have to read the read the application form properly and make sure that you're following the guidelines because if they want you in the if they want it in the one ink, I'm sure they'll say it on the application form. Um, Wanderly Massafelli, hi there. My instructor told me that I can only turn into a road or getting into a roundabout the second gear. I, I think you mean in second gear, is it? Never third or above. Is there any exceptions? Yes, there's there's course of course there's exceptions. There, there, uh, this kind of nonsense about oh you can only do this in second gear or third gears is is it's just completely incorrect. There's always exceptions. I, I often tell people that, generally speaking, second gear is the best is definitely the best gear to do roundabouts or junctions in or something like that. But there may be a, f a few small exceptions whereby it looks better if you do the roundabout in third gear because the roundabout is nice and big and open and it could be very quiet and there's nice wide lanes and you've got a clear view. You don't have to go all the way down to second gear then. You, you, just, you just don't. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have to be so like rigid that way. Generally, second gear is the best, but there, there will always be exceptions where you could do certain things in third gear. That much I can promise you. Rachel, passed my test after three times in Dublin. That's brilliant. Uh, on Thursday, thanks to these videos, my pleasure. Got eight grade two, so you just about got it, but still you got it, and that's the main thing. The tester and the tester, but your videos really helped me to not get the marks on observation. That's brilliant news, Rachel, and delighted to hear that, so well, well done to you. Um, Harry Meehan, passed first time on Wednesday, brilliant, your vids helped a lot, sure, you're very welcome Harry, great job on passing, I'm delighted to hear that, uh, King King Yu again, I have sent two photos, uh, also a, with a birth certificate and national insurance number, is that enough ID, um, I, 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 are you talking, I, are you in England or something King Yu, because I, I don't, I don't think that that's required here in Ireland, um, two photos, you, you don't send photos in um your photos get taken in the ndls center i i think i think you must you must be in some different country king king you if i'm saying that right because in ireland you don't you don't send photos away and i don't think they ask for birth certificates and national insurance i, I pps number maybe but uh yeah i think you might be in england or scotland or somewhere like that or wales i'm not sure i don't think you're in ireland um Ke Kehindi, Kenny, Agbun, Yadi, hi then. Please, is it possible for people to adjust their mirror on the driving test for a reverse around the corner? Yes, it is certainly possible if you want to. I don't advise it because I think it creates blind spots. Um, but uh, if you want to reverse your, if you want to reverse, or sorry, if you want to use your, um, if you want to, if you want to put your mirror down, that's fine. Just don't forget to turn it back up again. You see, after you move off, you see, because. It, it's I think they create blind spots and you're you're limiting your vision from people behind you if you turn your mirror down but you can do it if you want and you can ask the test to adjust it if, if needs be um but uh yeah so you can if you want basically but I don't advise it um if you are going to do it just make sure you fix it afterwards okay King you he is in Ireland Derry um but only if you don't have a passport see yes you're in you're in Ireland you're in Derry which is obviously with this part of Ireland but I uh, um for the moment they're probably going by uk rules so it's probably a different system to the 26 counties there you see 
So I'm not 100% sure of what, what, what way it is there. Um, so you might, I can't answer that for you, King, King you there, but uh, you, you're going to have to kind of maybe talk to someone in, in authority about that because I'm not 100% sure of your next steps. But thanks for clarifying anyway, I appreciate the comment. So a few more comments there, folks, before we finish up. Sorry, a few more questions, I mean. Uh, so these are the last few questions now that you could get asked on your driving theory test or, or the, the theory part before your driving test. So how would you check that your reflectors are working pro properly? So your reflectors are on the back of the car and they're normally red and you would check that they're working by making sure that they're, they're attached to the car properly, that they're symmetrical, so they're the same level uh, either side and that they're nice and clean and free of any damage or cracks, okay? You can also shine a light on them to make sure that they're uh, working and reflecting light properly if you want to test them. Um, Wanderly Massafelli, thank you very much for that super chat. really appreciate that. Um, very generous, Wanderly. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to read your comment out there since you donated. Thanks for the reply. Uh, your videos have been amazingly helpful. But it's absolutely my pleasure, and thank you for your kind donation of 10 euros. I really appreciate it. It's people like you who give me the encouragement to keep going uh, so thank you and well done to you how would you check that your handbrake is working this is a common question that gets asked I get this a lot in emails so if you want to check that your handbrake is working okay bring your car to a hill preferably park on, on a kind of a downhill because it's you know, you're probably going to see better on the downhill uh, so park your car um, somewhere safely pull up the handbrake um, and as you pull up the handbrake just you know Make sure that it feels okay, that there's no rattling noise or that it doesn't shake or there's nothing unusual about it. And then put the car into um, neutral because when it's in neutral, you're going to be able to test it better because if you leave the car in gear, it's going to be, you're not going to really get a feel for it. Then release the foot brake and then the car should hold then perfectly fine on the hill when you have the handbrake up and in neutral gear without the help of the foot brake. Then you can put your foot on the foot brake again then just for safety and let the handbrake down. And make sure that the button presses in okay, that it's not stiff, that it's not rattly, it's not shaky, anything like that. that there's nothing unusual or odd about your handbrake and how it feels okay. But basically that's how you check it, that it should hold on the hill then that way. Um, what do green ref what does a green reflector post mean on the side of the road? So this, this is to highlight that the road or that a turn off is there. Uh, it's very helpful at night because it reflects at night, so you know that there's, there's a turn off there at night time then and it shines up. Same with the green reflective studs on the road. You might see those little kind of cat's eyes. Uh, just to tell you that, that there's a turn off there at night. Um, another question then. Um, how would you check that your steering is working properly? So yeah, you would. You could check your steering by... When you turn on your engine, turn on the ignition, um, move the wheel left and right, and it should move freely. It should move without any stiffness. Uh, there should be no rattling or vibrations or shaking or anything like that. You could also go to a nice open area as well, a safe, open, quiet car park, for example, and just drive the car in a straight line and just make sure that the car doesn't pull to the left or pull to the right because it could be an issue with wheel alignment or wheel balance then if that's the case. Um, so that's how you would check your, your um, steering in general. Okay. And they are the main questions then, folks. I think we've covered about 55 or 56 there. Um, and that will bring us to the end of this live stream. Now, I want to make sure I'm up to date on my uh, comments. Yeah, Wanderly there was the last one. And uh, we've, we've, we're up to date on that. So just, just to summarize then again, folks, uh, any questions, any issues you have, anything you're unsure of, email me, daintai at gmail.com. I'll get back to you the same day if I can uh, with a detailed response and I'm happy to help you out with any questions you have. Uh, if you are emailing me, just give me some information about the test and why you failed or what the test said to you. MockTheoryTest.ie there, great site there. Uh, you can do some mock theory tests. There's a paid version, but you can, you can try it out for free as well and it's a great way of preparing for the theory test when that eventually gets up and running. MyRoadSafety.ie for applying for your test, applying for your permit. It's the go-to place for all that. NDLS.ie for any license requirements, okay? Uh, if you want to donate there to me uh, by making a voluntary donation, you can certainly do that, and I'm very appreciative of any help. And thanks to the people there, like Wanderly and all who, who super chatted there uh, throughout the live stream. Really appreciate your help. A couple more comments there, folks, before we finish. Void check. Do you think that some people learn theory mostly from mock tests, not official rule book? and confuse some questions. I remember when I was waiting for my theory test, there was a guy who was also 
waiting for his theory test and was repeating some questions but was talking rubbish. Yeah, it's it, everyone's different, Wojciech. I don't know, to be honest with you. I, I always think the best way to learn the theory test or the theory is to do tests like you see on, on mock theory test.ie or on the CD, you know, the PC CD ROM because that's more realistic. As well as, you know, watching my videos maybe and reading the rules of the road book and that kind of stuff. But everybody learns their own way, see, everybody learns differently. Some people can read and read and read and it all goes in. Other people need a more interactive approach. It just it just depends on everything. Depends depends on the person, sorry. Dennis Sherry, thanks thanks Dennis. You've you've made some great comments today. Um you sound like you're a rock of sense. Uh thanks very much. Another great life. You're very welcome, Dennis. I might be taking a bit of a break now, folks, for a few weeks. Uh, because I need to be focusing on other things. So this might be my last uh, video for a while, but I will be back um soon. Like I mean, sometimes on this channel, I might I might go away for a few weeks, a few months, but I will be back anyway, and I'll I'll update you more on that um in the next week or so. But we we'll leave it there, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for sharing your experience because I learned from your your experience as well, and um it's been great spending the few hours here with you. Uh, congratulations to anybody that has passed the test the best of luck to anybody who has a test coming up and as always folks mind yourselves and stay safe thanks for watching i'll see you soon